Thanks to all of you for coming. It's a great to have you here. Thank you for your interest. Uh, what we want to do today is just to give you a little bit of a background as to who we are and this, what we're doing and why we think that this is important. So we are ANZUP Cancer Trials Group. ANZUP stands for the Australian and New Zealand Urogenital and Prostate Cancer Trials Group. What that means is that we exist to do clinical trials in cancers of the urinary system, so kidney, prostate, bladder, testicle and penile cancers, cancers of the penis, um, because we're trying to generate new evidence and new understanding about how to do things better. Our overall aim is to improve outcomes for everybody affected by these cancers, and the only way we can do that is to generate evidence through clinical trials and by bringing everybody together. We're in the middle of our annual scientific meeting and the theme for this meeting is making connections and this is one of the connections that we, we need to make. We need to hear from the community and we need to be able to communicate back to the broader community as well. So here's a bit of information from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and you might not be able to read it very easily from the back but it's showing what's happened to survival trends for a whole range of different cancers between two eras the late 1980s compared to uh, the, the mid-teens, so 2011 to 2015. And if the arrow is going to the right, that means that survival has overall improved for that cancer, bearing in mind that it might include very early cancers and very late cancers. If it's going the other direction, it's, it's uh, actually not improved. And in red just there, I've outlined some of the cancers we're talking about here, so kidney, prostate, bladder and testicular cancer. And you can see that for most of those, it's actually been a big, at least a small, but in some cases a big improvement in survival, which is terrific. We're doing things better. But look at bladder cancer there, the orange one, um, two-thirds of the way down. For some reason, bladder cancers aren't doing as well now as they were back in the 80s. We've got no idea why that is. It's not that we're not using effective treatments anymore. We're probably better able to find these sorts of cancers, but for whatever reason, that cancer's behaving differently now than it did back then. We don't understand that, and we need to understand it so we can turn that arrow around. So what can we do? We can guess and, and, uh, and based on our previous experience, or we can actually do something. And the reason for ANZUP's existence is to bring together people who are interested in the care of uh, people affected by these cancers and to do the research to generate the evidence that we need to improve outcomes. So this is another problem. Um, one of the words that I hate to read is the B word, the breakthrough word. You'll see this all the time in newspapers, uh, on TV, current affair, God help you if you watch that sort of thing. Um, and if you look at that, you'd be forgiven for thinking that we should have cured cancer years ago. Every two days there's another breakthrough and the step has moved ahead. Now if you drill down into that, usually someone's cured cancer in a mouse and Here's a secret, it's really, really easy to cure cancer in a mouse. You can give them massive doses of treatments and they never complain. So that's not very much of a challenge. If you drill down into some of these reports, you'll see, oh, this might be a treatment at some point in the next five years. Well, that is completely useless to someone who's affected by cancer now. And if it ever does turn out to be of use to anyone, that person probably hasn't even developed their cancer yet. So who's it actually helping besides selling that newspaper? Here's a, an article that was published back in 2003 showing what happened to some of these media reports of breakthroughs in cancer outcomes. And you can see that almost half of them, when more work was done, it actually didn't hold up anymore. And about 10% it was completely turned around. Um, about half of them, there's still some potential, but we need to do more work. And only about a quarter of them had been or soon would be entering clinical practice, 10 years after that initial report. That's a bit depressing. So we need to do better than that, but also we need to be careful not to believe everything that you read. So what do we need to do? We need to understand the disease better, obviously, and there's a lot of basic research going on there. We need to get new treatments, but we also need to use older ones more effectively and in the right people. We need to understand the person that's, that's affected by it, because one treatment that's suitable for one person might not be ideal for the next one, and the context that we're doing all of that. We need to discover new ways, new ideas and better ways of using old things. And then when we've got a new intervention, whether it's a new drug or a new surgical approach or a new way of, of, of uh, imaging cancer, seeing exactly where it's located, we've got to prove to ourselves these sorts of questions. Does it work? When should we use it? Who is the most appropriate people uh, to use it in? How does it stack up against our previous sort of treatments? Is it any better or worse? Or maybe it's the same but it's easier or cheaper? And what's the cost? And that's not just the financial cost, but also the personal cost to the person having this treatment. What if this new treatment is associated with unacceptable side effects? What does that mean? 
So as I said, ANZ UP is a cooperative cancer clinical trials group. We've got over 1,500 members across Australia and New Zealand and internationally, representing all the different disciplines involved in the care of, of people affected by this cancer and in the research of it. And, and we're here to improve outcomes for people affected by these cancers. We're a not-for-profit company. We're a registered charity uh, across Australia and New Zealand. And one of the things that we really need to do, and, and I think we do quite effectively, is to engage with our stakeholders. There are groups like the Cancer Councils, Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, Movember, um, various other bodies, Cancer Australia, but also with the broader community. And that's what we're here to do today, is to try to um, uh, communicate a bit better about what we're doing. Belinda is chair of our Consumer Advisory Panel, which is a fantastic and diverse group of people with experience uh, personal experience in all of these cancers, but also really practical advice and, and common sense that they're feeding back to us. And they're a great conduit uh, to tell us what we should be thinking about, but also to help us communicate more effectively to the broader community. You won't be able to read this, and I won't spend much time on it. It's basically just showing our overall structure, and that is that um, we've got a governance structure at the top, but we have got at the bottom there various subcommittees that um, are involved in each of the cancers that I've mentioned. We've also got one involved in translational research. That means looking at the science underlying these uh, different cancers and treatments. And a quality of life and supportive care subcommittee as well. It's not all about giving a drug and putting out with side effects. It's making sure that the experience of people dealing with cancer and cancer treatment is as good as it possibly can be. So there's a lot of research happening across all of those areas and there's a number of fundraising uh, initiatives linked to all of that as well. So how do we go from an idea to a, to a trial? If you're thinking about clinical trials, you're here hopefully because you're interested in understanding this. And if you're thinking about a clinical trial, you might think of clinical trials that are done by industry, sponsored by a pharmaceutical company, for, for example. So where do the ideas come from? Well, a lot of clinical trials are done by industry and they want to get their products on the market and there's nothing wrong with that. They have to get shareholder returns and they would actually love to cure cancer because they would make a fortune. And I would love for them to cure cancer as well because that's actually what we're here for. So no one is going to begrudge company X getting filthy rich on a cancer cure if they're actually genuinely able to cure cancer. I think that would be a fantastic thing to happen. They are not the bad guys. Nobody is in this, in this game. But ideas can also come from other sources, not just from the company, but from individuals and groups like ANZA. We're the people actually looking after people with cancer and, and their families. We see the clinical need every day in the underlying science, and we would also like to cure cancer, but we don't have the deep pockets and resources that industry do. And the sort of questions that we might want to ask might be the ones that a drug company might not be able to. So it might involve using a, a, a treatment from one company and a separate one. And those two companies might not naturally work together, but we're able to do those sorts of studies. Or it might be using a, a drug that's been out there for a long time in a different way. And again, a, a company is unlikely to put resources into doing that sort of thing, but it's a type of trial that ends up with, is able to do much more easily. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't spend a lot of time on this diagram, but I'll just walk you around this circle and show where, where we go. So at the top is an idea which gets expanded up into a sort of half one-page concept. And it goes to one of our subcommittees and it's bounced around a little bit and fleshed out a bit and we say, okay, this is something that we want to pursue. It then goes to our scientific advisory committee, which has got representatives of all the different disciplines uh, so that we can help flesh it out even further and prioritise it and start thinking about what resources might be needed. We then go out to the hospitals and the clinicians to say, is this actually something that you're going to be able to do? Is it feasible to do? Get an idea of whether we'll be able to get enough people on the trial. Get a working group together to start pulling all the documents together and then to do the trial. And you might think that that is where things, where most of the activity happens. But in fact, that's the beginning really of the hard work because then we've got to actually do the trial, follow it along, get all the outcomes, tie it together. And then, hopefully, we've discovered something that's going to change practice. Because unless we can get to that point, we actually haven't achieved anything here except a bit of scientific self-stimulation, which is always fun, but uh, might not result in a difference. So at the end, we're wanting to do things that are going to change practice and outcomes for the better. So at various points along that, that cycle, we want to do things that are going to add value. So to try to understand the disease a bit better and why some people will benefit and some will not. Uh, and that might also include quality of life issues, it might include health economic things, so we look at all of that as well. 
Our consumer advisory panel has got input in all of these sorts of areas and, and more and really helped uh, to steer this entire process at every level of the organisation. And we do work with other groups to help uh, work through the operational aspects of doing the, the clinical trials as well. But it takes a long time. It's complex, it's expensive. I, I wish we could get an idea and today and get a trial going next week and have the answer by the end of the year and, and, and change things. It just doesn't work that way. It takes a long time to even get to that point of initiating the trial. It's complex and it's very expensive. I won't walk through the different types of clinical trials, the phase one, two, three trials, but what all of this means is that there are are processes for development that we need to work through to make sure that we're using these treatments safely and most effectively in the right group of people and that we're looking at the right sort of outcomes. We do have to engage with companies because they often own these medications or other things that we want to use, so we've got ways of doing that. And we have to interact with the regulatory bodies like the federal government and ultimately think about how we make this accessible to people. Would it be ending up on the PBS, for example? So where does all that money go? Well, most of it is spent on actually the operational aspects of doing the clinical trial. It costs money to employ the research nurses and to collect the information, to do all of those things, to pay for scans and tests and ethics submissions and things. A significant component goes to the trial management, which is collecting the data and making sure it's all clean and, and meeting the very high standards of that. And there are some group costs as well in terms of oversight of the trials. And then thinking ahead, because once you started a clinical trial, you actually also then need to be thinking about what the next one is going to look like. Because if you wait to the end of the trial, then you've got a big hiatus when nothing is happening and we can't allow that to happen for our patients. So what does it all mean? We are making progress. Uh, it's, it's uh, actually small steps, not huge leaps forward. It takes a long time and it's expensive. And just if you take one message away from what I'm saying, beware the breakthrough story because they're usually not quite as much breakthroughs as you'd hope they might be. There are ways that you can help. You can support research so you can take part in it. You can demand that more of it's being done. We can kill off this guinea pig mentality that we're experimenting on people for our own nefarious purposes. We hardly ever lock people in cages and give them lettuce, um, but we do want to work with people to make sure that their outcomes are as good as they can be. And we're hoping that we'll end up as a standard question for our doctor, are there any trials that might be suitable for me? And if we can do that, then I think we've done something very good. Now, I'll just point out that it's currently 1.20 on the 21st of July. At 12.56pm, it was exactly 50 years since the moon landing. And one of the things I, I refer to when I'm talking to patients on my clinical trials is that they're like Apollo astronauts. They've gone out, sometimes at considerable personal inconvenience or even risk, to try to improve things, not just for themselves, but for other people. So we're very, very grateful to everyone who contributes to our clinical trials. Uh, everyone who does so makes a, a really positive impact in this whole initiative. So thank you in advance. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.